we can have a will uh, compliant with Sharia uh, with no problem. At the Awad and Khoury Law Offices near Newark, New Jersey, attorney Abed Awad consults with Muslims about creating contracts, wills, and other legal documents that adhere to the principles of Sharia, Islamic law. And that's important to Muslims like Asif Mustafa. The way of, of Sharia means that there's a guideline for how I should be interacting or doing commerce. Awad says over the past decade, he's handled more than 100 cases that have involved some component of Islamic law. Now a growing movement seeks to ban state courts from considering Sharia in any way. Awad says this would restrict his ability to litigate cases and judges' ability to decide them. These things will trickle down to your average American Muslim when it comes to uh, distributing his estate, getting married, issues re regarding their dissolution of marriage. This is divesting courts of their own authority. But proponents say legislation is necessary to protect American interests. Karen Lugo is an attorney and anti-Sharia activist. The problem is that within a society, a Western culture, you cannot have two prevailing legal systems side by side. Ultimately, there will be a breakdown of what we in our country have agreed to, to be governed by, which is this consent to, to live under a rule of law, not of men, not of clerics. Sharia is an Arabic word that means path to the watering hole. For Muslims, Sharia is the divine law revealed in the Quran. Sharia is a methodology to engage in the divine uh, text, to ascertain divine will. It's constantly in flux, it's evolving, uh, it's very flexible. The other meaning of Sharia, which is the more common, is this human interpretation of divine law, which is then codified into laws and differs from country to country. And generally, when we're talking about Sharia or even criticizing it, we tend to be thinking of the human interpretation. The bulk of Sharia deals with topics surrounding worship, diet, family relationships, and financial transactions. But there are also principles for political order, crime, and punishment, and how these have been interpreted and applied in many predominantly Muslim countries raises concerns here in the U.S. David Yerushalmi, an attorney and Orthodox Jew, is one of the most prominent and controversial voices in the anti-Sharia movement. If you look at the actual doctrine that the Mujahideen, the various jihadists around the globe, say drives their jihad against the West, it is Sharia law and its doctrine of jihad. If we are to take them seriously, and I would of course suggest that we ought to, that that becomes a national security threat. Some people who've lived in countries where Sharia is the basis of law agree. It's really time for the West to understand what are the consequences of welcoming uh, Sharia or even uh, saying that Sharia is misunderstood. There is nothing misunderstood about a law that condemns women to, st women to stoning, to death, and to flogging. There's been a contentious Sharia debate across the country. In 2010, voters in Oklahoma passed an initiative to ban state courts from considering Sharia but a court challenge has so far prevented it from taking effect. Activists are now supporting bills that don't explicitly mention Sharia, but instead ban courts from considering any foreign law. Four states have now enacted such laws, and similar bills have been taken up in more than 20 other states. Yerushalmi wrote a widely used model bill called American Laws for American Courts. It doesn't identify Sharia per se, but because it doesn't have to, although Sharia certainly incorporated within its, its reach. It says any foreign law or foreign judgment that would violate in the particular case at issue a fundamental constitutional liberty of one of the parties, due process, equal protection, the court will not grant it recognition. Aziza Al-Hibri is Professor Emeritus at the University of Richmond Law School and founder of Karama, Muslim Women Lawyers for Human Rights. She says she too is concerned by how Sharia has been interpreted and implemented in some places, especially overseas against women, arguing that it is not a true representation of Islam. Still, Al-Hibri says anti-Sharia legislation is unnecessary. 
our Constitution basically trumps everything else. And that also goes on the state level with the state law. You don't just bring a law from another country and impose it here if it is against public policy. That's not how we work here. We can have a valid polygamous marriage out of Egypt. And if this polygamous marriage is re uh, brought to the United States and the court is requested to enforce Egyptian law, which would permit polygamy, but that violates our public policy. So a U.S. court would not recognize it. Awad, who also teaches at Rutgers Law School and Pace Law School, says the circumstances where Sharia is relevant in U.S. courts are limited, mainly to providing additional information for a judge reviewing, for example, a contract that follows Sharia financial guidelines. He applies basic New Jersey contract law. So he's not really enforcing Sharia. Sharia is just a tool to aid the court to better understand what it is reviewing. Awad says anti-foreign law bills could affect other religious groups as well. This uh, vast uh, net that is being cast to prevent state judges from considering any foreign law is catching in its net Jewish law, canon law. Interfaith groups, including many Jewish groups, have also been vocally opposed to the legislation. We refuse to be divided along religious lines. It is what is at stake in this debate over Sharia law. And I'm proud to stand with all of you and with my colleagues here to say that is simply un-American at the deepest and most profound level. Anti-Sharia activists contend that Islamic law has been used in unfair decisions against women, especially in domestic cases. In the most frequently cited case, a New Jersey woman tried to get a restraining order against her husband, alleging that he raped and beat her. After hearing testimony that the husband's Muslim faith obligates wives to have sex with their husbands, the judge denied the restraining order. Many Muslims agree that was a mistake. Muslims were upset because we don't believe that especially women, that God permits the, the man to beat the wife. Um, human rights activists were upset. Uh, con constitutional scholars were upset. Everybody was upset. And you know who was upset as well? The appellate court, which immediately reversed that decision because it was a bad decision. The woman happened to have an attorney, and she happened to have sufficient funds to make an appeal. And only then was it corrected. Well, how many women like this woman, who can't afford an appeal. Muslims around the country say the legislative efforts discriminate against them. It is to create this fear of Islam and Muslims in the larger society that, oh, Islam does not belong in America, these are foreigners, don't trust them. The Islamic Circle of North America, ICNA, has launched a national multi-million dollar campaign to counter what it believes are negative misperceptions about Sharia. The campaign features billboards, informational mailings, and community forums about what Sharia is and is not. Thank you for calling 1855-SHARIA. How can I help you? ICNA has also set up a toll-free hotline where Muslims and non-Muslims can call to ask questions about Sharia or get information about the push for legislation. They can say that it is anti-foreign law, but we know it is targeting one community, one faith. Is not the Sharia doctrine part of the jihadist doctrine? The moment you begin to just ask the question and engage in a real discourse, you become branded as an Islamophobe and they attack you and they attack you. Anti-Sharia proponents say they intend to keep up the pressure on the local level. If the law doesn't pass, it engages enormous debate because the opposition has put the brakes on, but that means it then comes up again at the next session. And there's another public debate. al Hibri's group Karama has been sponsoring town hall meetings to make sure the public debate includes Islamic law experts. She says open dialogue and education are the only way to resolve the conflict. The Muslims should not live in fear, and the non-Muslims should not live in fear. This, this is a country which is based on courage, on production, on trust in each other, and if we need to talk about it, let's talk about it and get over any Islamophobia, which, you know, which is unjustified. But given the level of polarization, resolution isn't likely anytime soon. I'm Kim Lawton reporting.